Hello everyone. I wanted to make a video and highlight the various uh, 3D arrangement tools we have in NetFab for print preparation for multi-jet fusion as well as SLS printing. So let's get started by opening a HP multi-jet fusion workspace and add some parts. I have a step file which has 47 parts and here they are as you can see when I scroll to the end I see all 47 parts this may not be enough to fill the build volume so I will go ahead and duplicate all these parts so I have two copies at the same location so now I have 47 times 2 94 total parts and keep uh, in mind the orientation of these parts so for example this part is in the y direction this part is in the y direction and so on uh, first pack I will use will be uh, the simple 3d bounding box packer uh, to make this demonstration go a little bit smoother what I did is I created a custom menu uh, if you're interested in making your own menus you can just go to the custom menus um, create a new panel, create new sub panels under that, and move things from the um, NetFab's uh, default panels and buttons to your own custom panels. So I've moved a couple of them here, and we will be using uh, these options for the most part for this demo. So let's go ahead and select all these parts, use the simple packing, 3D, the part distance between the part, the distance between the parts will be five. Uh, the distance between parts and the sidewalls will also be five and we will just pack the platform and once again we're paying attention to the orientation of these parts and as you can see those parts are still in the same orientation these two are the ones we were highlighting as well as these ones right here right uh, they are still in the y direction and this packer does not rotate the parts it simply translates them and places them in the build volume based on their outbox and because of that it couldn't fit all the parts with these settings so we may want to use a different packer and NetFab has many uh, packers available for you to arrange your parts so the next uh, 3d packer we'll use uh, just to demonstrate the difference is the Monte Carlo packer this packer allows us to rotate the parts in in arbitrary directions or around the z-axis or uh, no rotation you would if if you manually oriented your parts you may want to choose the around the z-axis only so that the top surface um, does not uh, change on your parts for example uh, assuming they are uh, planar uh, this packer has a lot more options such as um, controlling its priority of packing a given part and controlling uh, the rotation allowed for a given part uh, we will stick with the five millimeter distance between parts and the five millimeter to the sidewalls uh, I've chosen the fast performance uh, just to improve the speed and we will visualize the parts motion so let's start the packing and the parts fill uh, the build volume like so and we can close and this time um, we will take a closer look at as to what happened and we will see that now this part for example is fitting into the open space within this part it is no longer um, stay this part is no longer staying in the bounding box uh, outside the bounding box of this part it is now occupying the bounding box of the other part and the parts have been rotated uh, as needed um, here we see a, a better pack density and in fact not only all the parts have been fit have fitted into the build volume uh, but we have some space to spare as well so here we're looking at a 190 millimeter packed height uh, out of the 250 or so millimeters available to us however uh, pack density is not everything when it comes to um, uh, 3d printing in SLS and MJF 
slice distribution is another really important uh, part. Um, before I go into slice distribution, I want to uh, do a quick uh, check. Uh, and the thing that I check for is collisions. So I want to make sure that the 3D packer that I'm using uh, does not result in parts colliding. And it looks like there is no collisions, which is great. And the other thing I check for is interlocking. I want to make sure that no parts are um, locked uh, within each other. Uh, and once again, no interlocking has been found, which is great. And for those of you who may not know what interlocking is, I'll demonstrate what that would look like. So I'll select these two parts and I'll isolate them. And I'll take the bottom one and rotate it like so, and maybe move it out of the way a little bit. So now, essentially, I've created a chain uh, of these two parts, and I can definitely print them using this printer. However, if I print them in these orientations and locations, I won't be able to separate them without breaking one. And that is not the desired outcome. So let's go ahead and undo using Control Z a couple of times and go back to our original no interlocking state. Excellent, let's show all the parts and let's fit everything into the screen. Um, so the next thing I would like to check before printing this would be my slice analysis. And how I do that in NetFab today is I select all my parts and say, slice these parts. And I type in a layer size. Now, this is not the layer size that I'll be printing with. This is just so that I can slice and take a look at the uh, area per layer. So I'll go ahead and start this and NetFab slices them for me at that thickness, and uh, I can move up and down the slices, right? And I will also able be able to calculate the slice analysis, how much area is going to be printed at a given uh, layer height. So with a 0 0.1 millimeter thickness, this will end up in 1900 um, slices, and I will have um, uh, all the way up to 154 centimeters square being printed at a given time uh, at the maximum and on the, on the minimum, uh, somewhere around maybe here, I will have, yeah, that's uh, something okay to look at, uh, some, something in the range of you know, 19 uh, centimeters square. Uh, so uh, what we really want to achieve in SLS and MJF is a more uniform distribution uh, of the area over different layers. And of course, it cannot be perfect. It will have to vary. But when there is a, a variance, we want, it to, we want those variances to be smoother. So how can we do that? Well, uh, we are going to try a different 3D packer. But before we do that, I'm just going to export the results of this layer per area graph as a comma separated value. And then we'll use Excel uh, to compare the output to our second pack. So I'll pause the video here. All right, so I have the export done. Uh, let's go ahead and clean this by deleting these slices and emptying the slice analysis. And we'll go ahead and clone the uh, first setup and create our second setup. And in this second setup, what I'll do is I'll use the Gravity Packer. Now, Gravity Packer is uh, great for uh, taking an existing pack and uh, letting it settle a little bit more so that we don't have uh, these um, obvious um, uh, gaps like so. So to do that, I'll set the Gravity Packer up. Uh, let's put it to the side again. I want to pack all the parts using an average performance to speed. Um, and I'll use the distance between parts to be medium. I'll allow parts to rotate in any direction uh, with distance to sidewalls once again being five millimeters. What I will not do is I will not pre-process the starting positions. I want to start from these positions. So I'll, when I'll say pack platform and this will keep their original positions and then have the gravity do its thing and have the parts settle under gravity.
All right, after about three and a half minutes, the gravity packer is finished and we can take a look at the result. So you can visually see a very different uh, packed outcome. And as we looked at it from the left, as the gravity packer was uh, working, you can see there is a very um, small amount of visible uh, see-through space left in this pack. Uh, our pack height uh, filling degree has decreased. It used to be 9.3, I believe, and now it's about 8.3. And that's why we cloned it, so we can take a look at what it was. Yep, 9.36 versus 8.3. However, uh, uh, even though our packed height has increased and our part height filling degree has decreased, uh, we may have a better build uh, to print. And uh, to take a look at that, we'll go ahead and select all these parts and do a quick collision check, make sure that there are no collisions. And if there is, we need to go ahead and fix those collisions. So it the software found some uh, collisions, so let's see where they are. Ah, there we go. So looks like we have a collision over there on that part and that part. So I'll go ahead and move that in the minus Y by maybe three millimeters. Perfect. We've fixed a collision and Next, we may want to do an interlocking test in case there's any interlocks, and there aren't any. Great. And we are now done with our checks. Select all of our parts and slice the parts just to see our graph. So once again, I'll use a 0 0.1, start at um, 0 and at the packed height of 214. Let's go ahead and start all of that. All right, so our slicing is done, which means we can calculate the graph. And here we see a much um, smoother distribution of our overall um, area uh, per layer. And we see a smoother transition between the high areas and the low areas. And we see a much smaller uh, maximum uh, area being printed. So let's go ahead and export this as a comma separated value and take a look at this in Excel uh, to compare these uh, graphs side by side. All right, so I opened up the CSV files and combined them into a single uh, sheet. So we're going to select these uh, three um, columns and we're going to insert a um, graph, a let's go with a recommended chart and let's go with this one right here. Hit OK, and to make it a little bit bigger, we'll go ahead and move the chart to its own sheet. And now we can take a look at our chart. So here we see uh, two um, lines. First one is the Monte Carlo uh, pack, which is blue, and the second one is the orange, which is the Monte Carlo and the gravity pack. And you can immediately see uh, the Monte Carlo and gravity is doing a much uh, smoother transition uh, between the, uh, the peaks and the valleys. And it doesn't uh, uh, stay on um, or in some of these early layers. Um, so here the, the um, x-axis is the layer number and the um, y-axis is the area. It doesn't stay on uh, for uh, so much, right? Uh, this one was roughly 154 max, and this is 119, which is kind of what we were showing here, right? 119. Um, so as you can see, uh, there is a, a big benefit of uh, taking a little extra time, and in this case, it happens to be about maybe three minutes uh, extra time for the gravity packer uh, to take the outcomes of your first pack taking a look at the slice analysis to see if that distribution is optimized for um, how much area will be printed on a given layer, and if those transitions are smooth or not, and if there's anything you can do uh, to smoothen it out a little bit. And in this case, the Gravity Packer helped us uh, with that smoothing. Uh, I hope uh, this uh, demonstration uh, gives you some ideas about how to 
uh, 3D pack your parts using some of the default settings, such as the um, uh, simple packing and understand the limits of uh, the software that you're using that uh, only does simple packing versus a Monte Carlo packing versus things like uh, gravity packing. And of course, uh, always double check to make sure that you do not have interferences between your parts and always double check that you do not have interlocking parts so that um, you don't end up with uh, parts that you print and throw away. Thanks for watching, and if you have any questions, you can reach us uh, on our online forums on autodesk.com. Uh, Thanks.